tutorial. Uh, today, this session, of course, is going to focus on server development. Um, I guess to anyone who wasn't in yesterday's tutorial, I said it before, but I'll mention it once more. Um, all of the slides for the beginner tutorial are at that same URL before these slides. So if you missed yesterday, don't worry, it's all up there and uh, easy to follow along. Uh, as a quick recap to what we talked about, so yesterday we talked about the data model, we talked about parsers, we talked about clients. Uh, today we're going to talk about server stuff, so we're going to talk about rolling ser your own server, we're going to talk about Happy's built-in JPA server, uh, and a few technologies that go with that. Uh, and then we've got one more session a bit later today where we're going to talk about a couple of sort of extra advanced features that sit on top of the API. Uh, including validation, and if you missed that today, we've also got one more session on valid validation, which is sort of a, door, a joint uh, .NET and Java session. That'll be tomorrow, uh, I think at 10 or something like that. Uh, and that's a joint with AWA. We're going to talk about both of the, uh, basically both the .NET and the Java libraries. So, let's talk about servers for a little bit. So, um, one of the main components, of course, of, of Happy Fire is the server framework. We started the entire library actually pretty much for this singular feature, which was, uh, which was building, building, you know, building servers on top of databases. Uh, the use case when we started the library, the very first thing we wanted to do, uh, this was started at University Health Network, of course, which is a uh, hospital network up in, or down in Toronto where I work. Um, and the reason we started this was actually a use case that I've heard lots of people at Dev Days over the years have, which is that we had a whole bunch of legacy systems, of course, like people often do. Uh, and all of those systems, of course, had existed long before Fire did, and many of them had their own, you know, they all had their own data models, they all had their own ways of doing things. But of course, you know, Fire being the new and modern thing, we wanted to put Fire on top of them and use Fire as our way of getting people access to the data inside those systems. So the whole reason we started uh, Happy Fire was basically to allow for you to take the library and plug it into your own database and have a Fire compliant API without having to worry too much about you know, about the nuts and bolts of, of how Fire works. You provide the database parts and Happy provides the Fire layer. So of course the library has grown quite a bit since then and we've added all kinds of other features, but I mean, if any of you have the use case, and I've certainly heard it lots today, or lots, lots even over yesterday, that you know, I've got my old system and it's not Fire, uh, this library is designed to help you with that, so hopefully it will. Um, a couple of you know a couple of little points on how the thing works. Um, you know we're using standard Java technology for servers, so we are using servlets like anybody who's doing servers in Java is. Uh, Happy Server will deploy really anywhere that you can deploy Java. It goes into Tomcat, and it goes into Jetty, and it goes into Glassfish and IBM WebSphere and all of the uh, all of the many many applica application containers that you see in the world of Java servers. So. If you've got, uh, if you, I don't know, if you've ever worked with, uh, with Java technology for servers, I'm sure the technology behind this will be familiar to you. Uh, I will say also that we are inspired by a couple of the popular frameworks for doing REST, framework, uh, doing REST services in Java. So there's things like JAX-RS that are super popular these days, uh, REST-Easy, um, what else one, Spring REST, there's a bunch of them out there for that. Um, Happy Fire's server technology is inspired by, the, by those libraries, but it doesn't use any of those libraries. So the way it works, which we'll get into in a second, will look probably familiar to, to you if you've used any of those technologies, but we're not strictly using them. Uh, I will mention there is a module for JAX-RS support. Uh, was generously contributed actually by Agfa, who spent a ton of time working on it and did some really cool work there. So there is parallel support for JAX-RS. That's not what I'm going to focus on today, just because there's kind of two ways of doing almost everything in Happy, but Servers is no exception to that. So there is JAX-RS support, which is in there. Um, and if anyone wants to know how it works, I'm happy to walk you through it, but that won't be our focus today. So the general design uh, for the library, as I was saying, is sort of built around the idea that you supply the database and Happy takes care of the rest. So I've got sort of a, a simple example, you know, a simple diagram of how this whole thing fits together. Basically, you can stick whatever database or whatever storage mechanism you want on the bottom, um, and then you sort of wire all that together with Happy, and Happy does the uh, all of the hard work of putting together an HTTP server sitting on top of that. 
So, I mean, examples that can sit at the bottom of that stack, we've got people who have built, you know, happy servers on top of MongoDB, on top of SQL Server, on top of MySQL, on top of EHR systems with MUMPS databases, I mean, whatever, you know, on top of file systems and CSV files, really whatever your source of data is, uh, the design of the library is such that you should be able to just stick, um, to just, you know, stick a Fire API on top of it. The way that uh, the way that it, you know the, the parts that are supplied by Happy, of course, is Happy deals with understanding URLs that come in and sort of figuring out according to Fire's rules. You know, are we is this a read or is this a create for a specific patient or is this you know is this a create for a patient or an update for a specific instance or you know or what have you? Um, Happy takes care of all of Fire's rules. I mean, it's not that Fire's rules are overly complicated, but Fire has specific escaping rules for URLs and sequences within URLs and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's got modifiers on search parameters and things like that. So Happy takes care of parsing all of that stuff out and then makes a bunch of calls to methods underneath that you have written to actually handle the Fire requests that come in. So building up a server in Happy. You don't actually have to do too much. This diagram kind of shows how this all works. Basically, we've got two components that are built into Happy. First off, there's this class RESTful Server, which is a basic, it's actually just a plain Java servlet. So anywhere you can put a servlet, you put Happy's RESTful Server. Um, the way that you stand up a server, and I'll show you an example of this in a second, is you subclass RESTful Server and add just a little bit of configuration in there that tells the server how, what it is you're trying to do. Most importantly, you tell it about a series of classes that you have created that are called resource providers. So a resource provider class is really, it's basically just a little POJO, a plain Java class that implements an interface saying it's a resource provider. It doesn't have to do much else other than that, um, other than implement a bunch of fire methods. So essentially your server, if you're supporting 10 resources, for instance, let's say you're creating a fire server with patient and encounter and observation and whatever other resources you're trying to provide, if you're doing 10 of them, you're gonna have 10 resource providers that sit inside your, inside your project, and each one of those resource providers will have a bunch of methods to, to implement the various fire operations that you are trying to create. Um, naturally, like anything else in the world of Java, you take the couple of Java classes you've written, uh, you probably create a web.xml file just like you would in a, uh, in a standard way, and I'll show you an example of that in a second as well. But basically, you take a couple of these things you've created, you package them all up into this, into this war file, this web archive file, just like you, you do sort of as you build these things in Java, and you deploy that off into a, uh, an application container. So Apache Tomcat is kind of the de facto one. That's the one most people use, but I'm, I'm personally a big fan of Jetty. Um, people use Wildfly quite a bit, and there's a bunch of other good ones. So basically whatever, whatever web container you've got, you deploy this, this big war file into it, and away you go. So let's take a look at resource providers and how these things look. So this is a simple example that, uh, that sort of shows you what one of these things looks, looks like. So we haven't got any code in there yet. Uh, we'll do that in a moment. But the first thing we do, of course, is we create a class. All it needs to do is implement that interface you see on the right, the, resource, the iResource Provider interface. Uh, iResource Provider requires one method and one method only, and you've got the example of that here. That method just tells the, the rest of the server what resource type is this resource provider for. So this is our patient resource provider. Um, I should have said this at the start. I'm going to pause for a second just to mention that all of the code up here, of course, is on, our, is on a GitHub repository. Um, do I have a link to that? I should put that up. Just quickly back to slide 54, perfect. So I should mention, of course, github.com slash furore slash dash fire slash fire starters. All of the examples that I'm going through right now, all of those are up on that GitHub. So if anyone wants to see those after the presentation, of course, that. Uh, there are a bunch of complete projects. You can try all of this code out, and this is where you will find all that stuff. And I really should have had that on the first slide, but there you go. So back to that. Cool, so let's flesh this out a little bit. So if you've ever used something like Rest Easy or Spring Rest or JaxRS or any of those things, this sort of pattern will probably be familiar to you. If it isn't, don't worry, it's quite intuitive. Uh, the general idea here is that for every fire operation you're trying to create, uh, you're trying to expose through your server, you will create a method in your resource provider and give it an annotation that says, this is the fire operation I'm trying to support. 
and they're relatively straightforward. I mean, essentially, if you are trying to implement a fire read operation, you create a method that's annotated with at read. If you're creating a fire create operation, it's at create. Uh, you can do fire transactions with at transaction. You can do fire operations with at operation. So really, everything is relatively intuitive. You just create a bunch of methods that are at whatever the thing you're trying to do. And there's a bunch of rules about how the methods work, of course. but you know, roughly they're intuitive. Hopefully everyone sort of looking at this can, you know, generally understand what's going on. Um, every one of these methods has, you know, has some particular to it. So if you're dealing with a read, of course, fire reads require an ID because the whole point of a read is you want to read back a resource by ID. So the rule within happy for a read is that you have to have at least one parameter of, with this annotation at ID param, and it will be of type ID type. Uh, which is fire's data type, of course, for ID for the for a resource ID, um, and that gets passed in, and all you return from that, of course, is a patient object. And I haven't created one in this example because I ran out of space on the slide, but naturally in there I would be saying new patient, and I would be populating it with values from a database or something like that, and returning it. Uh, create works kind of similarly. Um, you get this little at resource param, which tells it this is the this is the the body of the resource being passed in. Uh, and of course, I'll do a bunch of stuff to save that. Searches work kind of the same way. You create a bunch of parameters uh, for the various search parameters that you want to support through your server, and so on and so forth. Um, all of this stuff is documented on our website, and I'm going to go there for a moment, just because I think, whoa, why did that open a new window? So I've gone to happyfire.io, and I will click on the documentation link that sits just over here. This time I'll go down to RESTful Server, which is one, two, three, four, five, six down, and at the very top, using RESTful Server, uh, there's a bunch of information that sort of is getting started. The next thing I'm going to go down to is RESTful Operations. So if I go into RESTful Operations, and I will bring you here just to show you that there are examples for how you write every one of these methods. So if you're wondering, you know, how do I do a read, there's an example of a read. If I want to get really fancy and do a conditional create, that's sitting there, and here's an example of how we put together a conditional create. Whatever there is in sort of Fire's RESTful API, there are examples of how you write all of those things sitting on this page. Uh, it's a really, really long page, so I'm definitely not going to go through all of its contents here, but whatever the thing you're trying to do is, there's probably an example of exactly how that looks in code that you can sort of copy from here and implement, you know, implement that thing. Now, how do I get back? There we go. Cool. So, the final thing, remember I was saying that the other class you have to create is this class that, you know, that you've written that extends from, that extends uh, Happy's built-in class RESTful Server. Almost nothing goes into that class, and again, you'll see an example of this on our GitHub, but really all we've done is we've created a class, we've extended RESTful Server, it's got this method initialize where you set it up, and all we've done in there is two little bits of configuration. First off, we give it a fire context. Uh, I'm giving it a fire context, just like in the client, what you want to do is create that fire context and keep it around, the server handles that for you. Really all you're doing is telling it that this is a fire DSTU3 or STU3 or R3, however you want to call that. All we're doing is we're saying this is a DSTU3 server, um, and then we will give it a set of resource providers. So I'm only going to register one of these things for a patient resource, uh, which means my server is only going to, uh, to expose that one type of resource, but I could just as easily you know, create, a, create 50 or 100 of them and pass them all in there. Um, magically behind the scenes, of course, Happy will go through, it will scan all of those annotations and all of your resource providers, it'll figure out what operations it supports, and most helpfully what it does after it scans all of that stuff is, I guess there's two things it does that are helpful. First off, of course, it'll start answering requests. So if a client comes in and says, you know, I would like to do a read on patient one, two, three, Happy is going to automatically call your method for that. So that's one cool thing it does. Uh, thing two that it does is it will generate automatically a conformance statement for your server, or a capability statement, I guess we're calling that these days. So the server will just automatically, if, uh, if a client comes in and asks for slash metadata, which of course is Fire's capability statement endpoint uh, for servers, the server will answer back with a capability statement resource, which of course, uh, I mean, I guess not of course, if any of you guys haven't seen this, is basically a nice declaration by the server of all of the things the server can do. 
So it will go through and it will say, I support the patient resource and you are allowed to read from me and you're allowed to create an update from me maybe, but you are not allowed to call transactions on me or whatever it is you've declared that your server is allowed to do. Um, that will all get automatically created by the server. So I will show you that in a moment um, by going through sort of a complete example of all of this. So the next slide, basically, what I'm going to do is show you a working example which comes off the GitHub page um, and is based. So there's a project in the Ferrari, in the Firestarters page called uh, Happy Fire Restful Server Skeleton. Uh, which is basically a little skeleton project that you could use to sort of get started uh, creating creating servers. What it does, as I sort of describe here, um, it's kind of, I mean, this is obviously not a, a big productionized solution or anything like that, but it's a simple server that stores resources in a, in a hash map. So we, what we'll do is seed it with a single resource in the hash map, but you can go in and create more and they will just get stored in memory in a hash map. And of course, they don't, they don't get persisted or anything like that, so this isn't a, uh, this isn't a very, very useful thing beyond, uh, beyond demonstrating concepts, but of course you could replace that hash map with a database or something else if you wanted something, uh, something more interesting. So here is the complete example that I'm about to show you. Um, this is our patient resource provider, and really what I'm gonna do in here is two things. First off, I create a little hash map. I guess it's three things. I create a little hash map up at the top. Maybe I'll point at that. So I create a hash map to hold my patients. Uh, in my constructor, I'm gonna seed it with a single hash map or a single patient. Uh, I will give that patient an ID of one. I'll put it in the hash map and then in my read method, I will go through and find the identifier. Using the identifier, I will see if I've got something in my hash map for that. Uh, and I will throw a resource not found exception if I don't find something and otherwise uh, that last line, which is being obscured of course by Chrome is uh, just me returning that patient object. There we go. So retur I returned it at the bottom. Um, I will mention, I guess, quickly um, within the, the Maven POM file, if, uh, if you guys, I, hopefully everyone knows what Maven is. Of course, Maven is the build system that we use for Happy. You don't have to use Maven yourself, but our examples all do. Um, I'm using this little plugin called the, uh, the Jetty Maven plugin, which I love because it basically means that I can write from the build tools, quickly spin up a demo instance of my server and run it. Uh, so I'm gonna do that right now um, and try and show you guys this server running. So in this little window, let's make that a bit bigger so you can see it. In this little window, that's probably a little bit hard to read at the back, but what I've said here is MVN space jetty colon run, which is Maven's command for running basically a little jetty plugin, which starts the, the happy Firestarter simple server product project. Um, I've gone through and I've run that. And what I'm going to do is open a new tab. I'm going to go to localhost colon 8080, which is the port that the Jetty plugin starts on. And I'm going to say slash patient slash one. So what it's going to do, let's make that a little bigger. What it's going to do is it will go into my hash map and look up the patient that I had stored in my hash map. And of course, I've given it the name Homer J. Simpson with this, this medical record number right here. Uh, so that all works. I can say metadata, which is the server's capability statement, and I can go through and we've got a really short one here because this server doesn't do much. What we see is we support the patient resource and we support read on that. We also automatically, by the way, Happy Works support read and search type on structure definitions, and that is about all of all that the server is able to do. It has declared that it supports Fire version 3.0.1, and that's kind of the extent of it. There's not much else in there. And just for completeness, let's go back to the patient endpoint, and I will look for patient two, which of course I did not seed in my constructor. I didn't put that into my hash map. So if I look for two, what I get back is this HTTP 500, or four, what is it, 404 error, uh, coming back and saying patient two is not known. So that's all being stored in the hash map and coming back. So this is kind of a nice, uh, simple example of getting a server off the ground, which is cool. Let's go back, there we go. So, once you've got your server up, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the concept of interceptors. Um, really, writing servers in Happy, there's really not too much to them, actually. Um, most of the heavy lifting is done by the framework itself. So naturally, you write a bunch of resource providers, that gives you all your access to data and all your CRUD operations and all of that stuff. 
The other main concept that people you know, always have is they always want some sort of behavior that they can sort of layer on top of the server for some purpose. Uh, and Happy provides this interceptor framework that lets you do that. So the general idea with interceptors is that at every step along the, the, the basically along the path that Happy goes through in servicing a request, you can register little callbacks that get called um, in your own classes and will do whatever logic it is you want to do. So, I mean, to give a couple examples of that, if you want to write code that's going to look at every request and log it in an audit trail or log it in a log file or check it for an authorization header and reject it maybe if there's no valid authorization token in there or if you want to do filtering based on IPs or if you want to, what are my other examples in there? You know, you've got, exam, you've got the ability to modify requests that come in if you want. You've got abilities to handle exceptions if you've got specific exception handling logic you want. Uh, you, even, you could even use an interceptor to, to modify the response if you wanted. So if you had some fancy encoding that was neither JSON nor, nor XML that you wanted to support, uh, it is perfectly acceptable for you to write an, an interceptor which handles the request even and res returns something other than fire. I mean, that would be a, an odd thing to do, but you certainly could do that if you wanted to. Uh, so interceptors really can do almost everything. The way they work is they've got a bunch of methods, as I said, that get called along the request chain. So essentially a request comes in, the very first thing the server is going to do is call this method called inter incoming request pre-processed, which is sort of a, a, de a declared method on the interceptor interface, which I'll show you in a second. Um, the request gets classified, which basically means that Happy goes through and looks at the URL and says, okay, this is a read, or this is a create, or an update, or whatever. Another method gets called, so you've got the ability to, in, you know, to change the logic there, or catch the request before anything else happens. The request gets parsed, which means basically if there is a, a resource body in the request, that then gets looked at and uh, you know, parsed into, into Java objects. You can then look at that as, again. Then, of course, your request gets handled by your resource providers. And finally, there's this method outgoing response that gets called one more time before the server actually returns. So at any, stop, any step along that entire sort of chain, you can override whatever method exists within the, uh, or you can implement whatever method exists within the interceptor interface and add your own logic to it. So Happy, of course, provides a bunch of interceptors built in, um, and they have, they have various useful things. So, I mean, to give you one example, we've got this logging interceptor. And this one, I use this all the time in testing. It's, it's really quite useful. Uh, logging interceptor is this really, really configurable thing. You can set it up to sort of, you know, do simple access log type logs where it sort of, you know, for every request that comes in, it says, maybe this is the IP that came, that the request is coming from, this is the URL they're after, and this is the access time or something like that. Uh, it's totally configurable. You can have it log how long the request took to process or what the, re the refer headers were, you know, whatever the thing is that's all sitting in there. It is happy to log the request body and the response body and the headers if you want, which can be super useful for debugging. Uh, so it can be as granular or as coarse as you want it to be, and it will log sort of any of that type of thing. So that one is super useful. Uh, the second one that's actually also quite useful is the cores interceptor. So, of course, if you are doing, <laughs> of course, if you were to <laughs> promised myself no puns and I've lost. Um, yeah, there we go. So um, if you're doing if you're doing cores, which I mean basically means if you are answering requests from JavaScript uh, applications and those JavaScript applications live somewhere other than where your fire server is, uh, and this is a really common pattern, of course. You've got a fire server sitting in one server and you've got like maybe an angular app or uh, you know some other type of web app sitting on another server. Uh, in order for that type of setup to work, you need to enable this thing called cross-object resource. I forget what core stands for. Uh, anyway, you need to enable cores. Uh, and one way of doing that, of course, is with the cores interceptor, which will handle all of that for you. Um, there are a couple of interceptors around validation. Uh, we're going to talk about validation a bit later. Uh, in a later session today, but naturally, if you want to validate requests on the way in or validate responses on the way out uh, and either reject them or log them or do whatever it is you want, if they're not valid, there are interceptors for that. Um, we've got this, this thing called response highlighter interceptor, and every one of my examples uses the response highlighter interceptor. Um, what it does is it gives you this really nice pretty printing. So if we go back for a second to my example, just to tell you why you want the response highlighter interceptor. So if you notice the response that came back is all sort of nice 
blues and purple colors and stuff like that. Uh, that is actually the response highlighter interceptor at work. Uh, if you don't use that interceptor, you're just going to get plain text that comes back, um, which is not as nice. Response highlighter is, is smart. It will only uh, it'll only sort of do that syntax highlighting if it figures that the request is coming from a user sitting in a browser. So if it's, you know, if it's looking at an Ajax request or an Android app request or whatever, it's not going to syntax highlight that, but it does try and help you with debugging and things, which is quite nice. Uh, and then finally, we've got this thing called the authorization interceptor, uh, which I think I will talk about in just a moment as well. So creating interceptors is super easy. Um, really, all you do, again, within your RESTful server, you all you need to do is call this method called register interceptor, and you pass in the instance of whatever interceptor it is that you want to deal with. Um, so I've got, you know what, my next slide is authorization interceptor. Before I even get to authorization interceptor, I will really quickly talk about, oh, maybe I won't go anywhere, but I will mention, of course, you have the ability to write your own interceptors as well. Um, the, there is a basically just an interface called iServer Interceptor, and there's, as you tend to do in Java, there's a, uh, a corresponding adapter class that lets you only override the methods you want, called Server uh, Interceptor Adapter. So the way that you create your own interceptors, of course, is you override that class and you implement whatever methods you have. And this is a totally normal pattern in Happy. You get lots and lots of people will, will do this for whatever purpose. So whatever the logic is you want to sort of layer on top of your server, interceptors will probably let you do that. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about one of probably, I mean, not even one of, definitely the most popular, the most powerful interceptor built into Happy which is this, uh, this interceptor called authorization interceptor. So I like to talk about this one just because a common question we get asked is how do I do something like smart on fire or how do I add security to my, to my system? Uh, and the long and the, you know, people always say to me, does Happy have built-in support for smart on fire? And my answer is always no, it, it actually totally doesn't. Happy deals with the data side of the interface, you know, giving you access to data and letting you write stuff on top of your server. We don't get into Smart on Fire mainly because there really is not one way to do security. We didn't want to provide a server that just out of the box implemented security one way and probably did it wrong for everybody that wanted to do it. Instead, we wanted to provide tools that would allow you to build security in whatever way made sense for your specific use case. So authorization interceptor is kind of a funny interceptor in that it's basically a half-finished interceptor deliberately. Uh, and the idea is that you will take it, extend it, and then add the rest of your logic. So the authorization interceptor is this neat interceptor that basically lets you, let you, lets you declare a bunch of rules for the request coming in, and then the authorization interceptor enforces those rules, which is a bit weird to explain, but the, the general idea is this. Um, let's say you've got a user who has signed in against an external OAuth 2 server or something like that, or even has sent in you know, a, a set of credentials in the request or something. You will write in your code, code to look at the token or look at the credentials and whatever it is, go to your access database, go, or go to your authorization database, or go to your Active Directory, or go to your file system, or wherever you're storing your user accounts. Validate the credentials, uh, and you've got an opportunity then to, you know, to reject them if they're wrong, but if they're right, you're probably going to figure out who your user is, and based on that, you're going to have some sense of what that user is allowed to do. So you might figure out that your user is a patient, uh, and that patient, of course, should only have access to their own data within the system, I will assume. Or maybe they're a, you know, a provider who has access to a, a team of, or a, an entire group of patients, or maybe this user is an administrative user and has full read-write access to everything in the database. Whatever the rules are, basically what you do is you will then declare uh, within the authorization a set of, I, am, I believe now this user is allowed to read everything in patient compartment one, two, three, for example. And Happy will then allow any requests for reading patient one, two, three, or reading observations that belong to patient one, two, three, or reading encounters. Uh, what have you. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of power baked into that. You can basically declare that this user is allowed to call specific operations, allowed to write some things but not others, uh, allowed to delete some stuff in compartments, whatever your rules are. I mean, there's, there's really sort of no limit to it. Uh, authorization Interceptor lets you do all of that, but of course it is, it's, it's limited by the fact that you have to write code to actually check the credentials and figure out what the user is allowed to do uh, and tell the Interceptor. So that's kind of the... That's the, that's the general idea there. So as a simple example of how this works, 
Uh, authorization interceptor, the way it works is you create your interceptor uh, by, over, by extending the authorization interceptor. All you have to do in there is implement this one method, uh, or override this one method called build rule list. And build rule list, really what it does is it looks at the request details that came in, and from there you can get headers, so I'm looking at the authorization header. Uh, you could get other properties if you had rules based on the source IP where the user was coming from, or certificates that the user presented, or you know whatever the thing is, you would validate that. Uh, and you then create a set of rules that get returned. So for example here, and I'm not checking the header in the example, but let's pretend I will use that to go and look at a database and see what my user is allowed to do. I create a set of rules by saying, this, on this builder, I will allow this user to access metadata, I will allow them to read all resources with NAID, and I'm going to allow them to write uh, resources of type observation uh, in the compartment patient123. So, I mean, this is one example of many we could do. We basically allow this user to read anything, but only write one type of resource for one patient. That's all we're going to allow them to do. The server will take care of the rest. So this interceptor, if the user then tries to write an observation that belongs to patient 4, or an observation that doesn't declare what patient it's for, or tries to write an encounter or something like that, the authorization interceptor is going to block that before it ever gets a chance to happen. So that's kind of the, the trade-off there. So an authorization interceptor, it's quite neat. I think it's actually one of, the, uh, one of the cooler little parts. So if you're trying to implement Smart on Fire, of course, this is the starting point. You, you know, you're going, to have, you're going to have some sort of authorization server. I mean, you could use OpenID Connect. You could use any of a number of Open, OpenID implementations that exist out there. Free ones, paid ones, whatever you have. You will write some code that looks at and validates the bearer token you get in your requests. You will get, you'll write some code that sort of parses that out and figures out what scopes they've got. You then pass those scopes into the authorization interceptor and it will enforce them for you. So that is the Java server framework. Uh, I'm going to talk about one more thing um, during the course of our server discussion, and that is Happy's JPA server la uh, layer. So the JPA server layer sort of is a layer that sits on top of, or I guess right on top of, the, 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 the Happy Fire server framework uh, and provides a bunch of additional functionality. So, the, the best way to explain this is, I was saying at the start, the server framework provides the idea that you supply a database, you've got your data model and all of that stuff sitting inside your database, and Happy Fire sits on top of that and lets you write a server framework and expose a server out. Um, let's say your starting point is you don't have a database. You want a Fire server, but you are not starting with any legacy system. You are starting completely from scratch, so you can do whatever you want. Um, Happy, Happy Fire provides an example, uh, and it's not even a, an example, it's a fully functioning, you know, production-ready server implementation that will sit on top of a database schema that it supplies. So the JPA layer basically is a complete Happy or a complete Fire server that sort of sits in a box and lets you deploy out onto, you know, again, onto any Tomcat instance you want. Um, Happy's you know, the JPA server framework, as you, you know, can probably guess from the name, we're taking advantage of the Java persistence architecture, JPA, uh, which is this nice sort of technology that allows you to write, uh, write database code that will talk roughly to any database that's supported by the, uh, the JPA provider you're using. So what we mean there is we do use a relational database underneath. We'll, you know, we'll talk to Postgres, we'll talk to MySQL, we'll talk to SQL Server or Oracle or whatever you've got underneath it. Um, and Happy will go into that database, create its database schema, do all of its indexing, all of that, and expose out a, a server for you. Uh, the JPA layer gets, you know, it supports all of the basic stuff that's in Fire, so it supports your reads and your creates and your updates and all of that stuff. It also has a whole bunch of, of fairly advanced and fairly powerful stuff as well. So, you know, I've got a few examples in here. We support stuff like e-tags and conditional updates and conditional creates, things like that. Uh, we support the patch verbs, we support, you know, all kinds of other sort of fancy little bits of the Fire API that are in there. Um, there are support for custom search parameters, so this is popular these days. If you want an index on an extension that you've created or on a field that Fire didn't define its own indexes on or its own search parameters for, you can upload a search parameters resource to the server and it will start indexing whatever you've declared in there. Uh, there is a full-blown terminology server based uh, built into that. Um, it's 
the terminology server, you know, you can do things like upload the SNOMED database into it or the LOINC database and do expansions, do searches for code under uh, whatever it is you're trying to do there. There is support for fire subscriptions, which is uh, an entire topic on its own, but a really nice way of getting notified when things change in the database. Uh, and tons and tons of configuration. I, uh, I'm a giant nerd myself, so I love lots of dials and knobs and things you can turn. Uh, there's tons of that in there as well, so I think I talk in a minute about how all of that works, but there's lots and lots of configuration you can play with in that as well. The general architecture, and I've got a, uh, a diagram up that sort of shows that. Uh, we're using Happy's server framework. This is the same framework we used for the rest, uh, you know, that we would have used to stand up our own, our own server. Uh, based in, built in that are a whole bunch of these resource providers. These are the same resource providers you would have created in the, uh, in the previous section. For the JPA server, we create them all. Um, then we've got this layer called the data access objects, which is just a bunch of code using JPA or using Hibernate. Uh, and then sitting underneath it are sort of two places where a bunch of data goes. So we use a relational database, so that could be Postgres or Oracle or whatever you have. Uh, we're also using another library called Hibernate Search, which basically allows full text indexing using this library called Apache Lucene. So with the combination of that, you've basically got indexing across all of your data, you've got full text searches, you've got terminology, you've got all of the things you would want that sort of fit together. Um, yeah, I've already talked about that. Um, mentioned Lucene, so of course Lucene gives you this nice ability to search for content within resources, to do full text searches, uh, all of that type of thing. So, I mean, essentially using the JPA server, and I'm, I'm almost done here, is that it's, it's quite simple, actually. I've got a skeleton project that sort of shows you how to get started. Really, all you're doing to use the JPA server example is creating a, a normal Java web project. So you're creating a project that has a web.xml file and, you know, gets packaged into a war file like anything else. Um, and most of that you can declare quite simply in a Maven palm file, and there's an equivalent for Gradle if that's the way you want to do it. But we've got an example that sits up at this long URL. Really what you're looking for is go to the Firestarters GitHub page yet again, and then look for the JPA server example project. In that project you will find a, a sample palm file, you'll find a sample web.xml file. Uh, there's a RESTful server that is ready to go. You can register your own interceptors to it if you want. You can change it if you want. You can add your own functionality on top of JPA. The whole thing is designed to be extendable if you need to, uh, but it will also out of the box run, and the second you run it, you've got a fire server which supports everything you want it to support. Uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is if you want to run the JPA server in an even, even easier way, uh, you don't even want to bother with creating war files and all of that, Happy has got this thing called the command line interface, uh, the Happy Fire CLI, which is this little server in a box tool. Uh, it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a little command line tool. You can download it, and really then all you've got is a command, Happy Fire CLI space run dash server. That will start up an instance of the JPA server. Um, it'll spit out a bunch of log lines and then eventually tell you a port it's running on. And the second you've got that going, you've now got locally sitting on your laptop or wherever you're running this thing, a fully blown fire server that you can use for testing. So the easiest possible way, I think, to get a, uh, a fire server up and running that you can play with is this CLI. Um, and this is all the same code that you would find in the JPA server. So I guess that actually takes me to the end of that. Um, I have got, of course, as I mentioned, uh, there's an exercise that is the simple <coughs> server. There's also the JPA server examples. So there's a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of fun code to play with that sit within the, uh, the Firestarters repo. Um, so if, uh, I think that is the end. I will see if there are any questions. But if not, there is lots of stuff you can play with. Any questions? <laughs> Cool, I'll take that as a no. Class dismissed, thank you all.